Andrew Bowie, you're 34 years old. What was the moment you realised you were a conservative? That's a really good question, Gloria. It's actually one of the toughest questions. Um, because it was, it's quite, it was quite unusual being a sort of uh, teenager in the mid noughties in Scotland and deciding I'm going to vote for the Conservative Party. But I suppose that I fully realised it in about 2007 when I was in, in the Royal Navy. And, you know, Gordon Brown was uh, Prime Minister, had just become Prime Minister. 10 years of Tony Blair. I think on the whole, they were doing quite a good job. But there are certain areas where I just felt they were letting the country down. And one of the areas was uh, in its support for the armed forces. I mean, I was in the Navy and I was reading stories daily about, you know, snatched Land Rovers or helicopters that weren't working in Afghanistan, guys being sent out to Iraq or Afghanistan with the wrong kit. And I thought, look, we need to do something about this. And yeah, I thought, but put my head above the parapet and, and actually join a political party and try and make a difference. And I'd always, you know, knew deep down that I was a conservative for various reasons. And so I joined the Conservative Party. But I had, I think, possibly the shortest membership of the Conservative Party on record. I joined the Conservative Party uh, in, in 2007, I think possibly in about the November. And... Uh, two days after my letter came through welcoming me into the Totnes Conservative Association, because I was based in Dartmouth at the time, I got a knock on the door from uh, the Master at Arms, who's the, uh, the policeman uh, on Dartmouth Naval College, instructing me that because Queen's Regulations Royal Navy stated at the time you couldn't be an active member of a political party, I would have to resign my membership of the Conservatives. So I was a member of the party for a week in about November 2007 before having to resign. Then I rejoined in 2010 when I was at university. So it was really a combination of factors. Also, you know, I, I felt that we were the, the party that best stood up for what I believed in and what needed to happen back home in, in, in the northeast of Scotland. And because you mentioned going to university, but you didn't go straight to university because, as you mentioned, joining the Navy, yeah. which you did straight after leaving school. Yeah. Give us one or two memorable moments from your time in the Navy. Yeah, I, jo I joined the Navy. My granddad was in the Navy for over 20 years, so I just wanted to do what he did. Now, obviously, quite obviously I haven't done it for 20 years, but I really wanted to... To, to, to serve and, and to serve in the Navy. I'd grown up with his photographs and, and, uh, and seeing what he'd done over those 20 years and I wanted to be a part of that. Possibly my, the highlight, um, although there were many, um, was when I was involved in the 90th anniversary of the Great War. We had the three remaining veterans of World War I, uh, Harry Patch, uh, Henry Allingham and Bill Stone, and we had them at the Cenotaph uh, laying wreaths on behalf of, you know, quite coincidentally, all three armed forces, all three served in different branches of the armed forces. So to be able to be there uh, with them, the last time they were ever in the same place at the same time, within two years, all three of them had passed away, and to be able to talk to them about their experiences and their lives and meet their families as well, that was a truly humbling experience and probably something that will stay with me well, forever. Well, you, you know, it becomes real what that generation went through, what they fought for. A generation that fought in the First World War, lived through the Second World War, and then lived the rest of their lives rebuilding this country from the ashes of that war. And it was a real privilege to, to meet them and, and you know, uh, have spent some time with them. So that was probably the, the moment that sticks out amongst many in my head uh, over my yeah, three and a bit years in the Navy. Yeah. You're elected to Parliament. Mm -hmm. And... That the parliament that you and I served in, obviously I'm not there now, you still are, but the years following, when Theresa May was Prime Minister, following the snap election and Brexit mm -hmm. and the Brexit negotiations, she held that election because she wanted to get a bigger majority to give her a stronger hand in those Brexit negotiations. She lost her majority in 2017. Mm -hmm. Oh, it was a really tough time for, for everybody, actually, the country, as well as people who were elected to serve them and whether we did a good job is debatable. But you were Parliamentary Private Secretary to Prime Minister Theresa May between December 2018 until her resignation as Prime Minister. Mm -hmm. All her premiership was turbulent. But you were at her right-hand side during the most turbulent mm. of periods when her party was turning against her, it, it, was, it was actually, even for an opponent, it was difficult to watch. Yeah. It, it was tough. Yeah, it's just a job, um, a hugely privileged a role to have, uh, to be in the room, uh, to be in those cabinet meetings, to be at the right-hand side of a prime minister, travelling with them to various meetings. But it's also, you know, a huge privilege. And you become very, you know, personally involved with the, with the prime minister. Um, um, and, you know, we were going through an incredibly tough period as a government. 
and she was going through a very tough period as Prime Minister, trying to hold the government together, trying to deliver the deal which had been negotiated uh, with the European Union, negotiating with her party, her own party, uh, to try and get that deal across the line, with the DUP, who we were reliant on, to remain in government, with the European Union to try and get some subtle changes to the deal that would make it acceptable to uh, the party and to the DUP. And, you know, some of the, the, the personal attacks uh, that she endured through that period when, at the end of the day, all she was trying to do, and, and, and uh, you know, I fundamentally believe, having gotten to know her, that every decision she took, she took on the basis that it was in the best interest of the country. She, was always, she always put the country first in every single thing she did. Now, did she get everything right? Did we get everything right? Absolutely not. But was the intention to deliver a good deal for this country so that ultimately we could move on from the division that Brexit had caused uh, into a new relationship with the EU. Yes, that's, that's what we were trying to do. We didn't manage it and, you know, hindsight's, you know, 2020. And, you know, um, it was quite obvious now looking back that that deal was probably never going to pass. Um, but we, yeah, it was, it, well, it was tough because you, you, you get to know this person. Uh, and you see the, the impact that all of these personal attacks and the, the, the trials of the job are having on this individual who you come to care for deeply. And, uh, and to be that person on which you know, they, they can rely um, to support them through the most difficult times is a huge privilege, as I said. But yeah, of course it was tough. I don't, didn't understand. I used to watch her giving statements for hours and hours while people were you know, questioning her from all sides. Yeah. Some of the toughest question, arguably, from her own side. I used to watch her and think, how do you get out of bed and put one foot in front of the other? It's remarkable, isn't it? I mean, I'm as an awe. Genuinely, some days I was an awe. There was a day that I think she took a set of... Her, she'd been in a, in a conference with Jean claude Juncker the evening before. Uh, she'd come back to London and, uh, and her voice had gone. Uh, and uh, she she'd had, she'd had a bit of a cold, but also smoke filled, literal smoke-filled rooms in Brussels. And so she had to stand up at this batch box and take questions on... Uh, on the, the, the agreement that she had come to with Jean-Claude Juncker. And, uh, and I remember she stood up in the statements and started to speak. It became obvious within a few seconds that her voice had gone and there was a sort of a gasp from the, from the House of Commons. Uh, she stood at that dispatch box that day for over two hours and took every single question that was put. Uh, and I remain, you know, as I said, in awe of her ability to do that, her stamina, her determination to keep going uh, despite everything that was being thrown at her was, uh, was uh, yeah, incredible. Quite an, quite an inspiration, actually, yeah. Agreed. Mm. You get made uh, chair, chairman, you, you, Tory party very much chairman, uh, by chair, <laughs> chair. <laughs> by two, chair. Two female leaders, Gloria, can <laughs> no, I remind no, no, you, no. thank you. <laughs> I know, but the late part of calling chairs, and I was about to slip into calling you a vice chair, <laughs> vice chairman of the Conservative Party, but, but you resigned from that post yeah. um, last year. Yes. Yeah. Surely a good job. Why, why would you Great resign? Great job. It was a, uh, look, I got made vice chairman when Boris became, uh, became party leader, became prime minister, um, with specific remit of youth in the Conservative Party, youth policy overall, and it was a huge privilege to do, because I get some, I think I'm really inspired actually uh, by the passion that young people bring to politics and trying to encourage them, of all sides, uh, to try and encourage them into political debate, because uh, I think that, you know, they bring an experience from a generation uh, that, 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 you know, we, 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 have, we, we don't understand as much because we haven't had the same lived experiences and an excitement and a passion that sometimes can uh, uh, be uh, worn down when you've been in politics for a little longer. Um, and so, yeah, I absolutely loved it. I toured the country speaking to young people, predominantly from the conservative side of things, but also from other parties, going to universities. And it was brilliant. It, um, I thoroughly enjoyed that job. I'd, I'd done it for, you know, over two years. Uh, by November uh, 2021, and um, I, I found I found our position on the Owen Paterson uh, um, uh, situation dif difficult to difficult to defend, um, and I, you know, decided that I was going to take a step back um, from being in the front line of defending government policy, you know, for a while, uh, and I took that decision, you know, reluctantly because I did enjoy the job. Um, and decided to focus on, on the constituency side of things for, for, uh, for the foreseeable future. And so that's, that's, that's why I did it, yeah. I do think that the government have learned a lot of lessons from the own partisan. And I think we are moving much more in the right direction now. I think that was a genuine mistake. And I think the Prime Minister himself even acknowledged that uh, at the time. But it was very difficult to defend it. Very honest. Um, 
So you were part of the Better Together campaign, the Scottish referendum campaign, Scottish independence uh, referendum campaign. Um, we are part of, we stayed, mm -hmm. but Scotland remains a part of the United Kingdom. That vote was won. Nicola Sturgeon, who described that as a once in a generation decision, says, well, there's been a major shift in the UK politics since the UK left the European Union, and that warrants Scottish people getting another say on their future. Hmm. What do you say? <laughs> you know, I, as I said, I joined the party in 2007 and again in 2010. This was not an issue when I was growing up. Scotland was in the United Kingdom. We had devolution. Really, all of my political life have had devolution. All of my adult life, actually, we've had devolution. And the idea that we would have spent, you know, nearly, what was that, eight years now talking about nothing else but the Constitution of Scotland, it was, it was unimaginable. It's incredibly depressing because there are so many other issues that we could be talking about and we're not. And, you know, for Nicola to say, the First Minister, sorry, to say that, you know, because of Brexit, um, Scotland needs to have another another say, another vote, another referendum on whether or not it should stay a part of the United Kingdom, I think it's just completely wrong. The white paper that the Scottish National Party produced ahead of the last referendum said that there was a, uh, a chance that there would be a referendum on Europe uh, should the Conservatives get a majority in the 2015 election. And so it was always, it was always sort of um, tied in that there, there may be a referendum on Europe. Um, and the UK as a whole took a decision to leave the EU. Now, I voted to remain. I was working in the European Parliament in, in, in 2015, 2016, and I voted to remain. But the UK as a whole voted to leave. And if you believe in democracy and you, and you believe that the results of referenda should be implemented, then ultimately you have to believe that on a whole UK referendum, you had to implement Brexit. Now, I understand that if Scotland was taken as a separate entity from the rest of the United Kingdom and the Scottish result was looked at uh, exclusively, then Scotland voted to remain in the, in the EU. But it wasn't an exclusive Scotland referendum. And over a million Scots did vote to leave the EU in that referendum. So to just paint Scotland as being of one opinion on this, I think is completely wrong. What we should be doing now is trying to make Brexit work and actually trying to deal with the fundamental issues that are causing problems in Scotland right now. Education, health, transport infrastructure, all the rest of it. That's what I think the First Minister should be talking about and tackling. And not, on, frankly, a distraction which allows her to, to, to talk about something which isn't, you know, pressing on the minds of Scots, and that's another independence referendum. It's frankly ridiculous. She used to get on with the job. Okay. We've done a lot of politics. Yeah. Let's get back to you. Okay. It's very exciting news is uh, heading your way. You're mm. going to become a dad yeah. in August. Yeah. Now, I want to know how involved you have been, how much, of a, how much support you've been given to your, been giving to your wife, and yeah. you've been going to prenatal classes, NCT classes. Tell me how you've both been preparing. Well, we haven't been at any classes yet, but I've... Uh, been as involved as I can be. Um, I think the whips are getting a bit annoyed at the amount of time I'm requesting off from them because 550 miles is a long way. It's not like you can just pop round the corner to St. Tommy's and then, you know, back to the office. It's a long way to go. So it involves me taking a whole day off, uh, but I don't, uh, I'm not doing it reluctantly. I, I'm, I'm very much enjoying being as involved as I am and cannot wait uh, for August, even though it's very daunting. Um, any of my friends are, you know, would tell you they'd be terrified at the thought of me being responsible for another human being on this planet. So being a dad is, you know, terrifying, but very exciting. And I'll be invol as involved as, you know, I, I can be um, with a job that takes you away to the other end of the country three, three four days a week. Is it worth it? Uh, is the, the job. Is the job worth yeah, it? Yeah, yeah, uh, Absolutely. The job is a huge privilege. And for, all the, for all the difficulties that we had in 2017 and 19 and all the issues we've had since, uh, and all the criticism you get in the press. This is the, the, the this remains a huge honor to have this job, to be able to speak up for people, for people that you care about and a place that you care about and call home in the Palace of Westminster, you know, and have, an, have a say and be able to input on decisions that really affect people out there in their everyday lives. It's a huge honor and a privilege. And we should never take that for granted. Um, and so, yeah, of course it is worth it. Um, so I wonder if I asked your wife the same question. So <laughs> three nights a week, sometimes four nights a week. She's on her own changing the nappies, isn't she? Um, 
Yeah. On, How are you going to make it up to her at the weekend? I don't Let's know. get well, it on record. <laughs> <laughs> I think she, she may be going off for the weekend and leaving me in charge. Uh, the house may be burnt down when she comes back, but no, it's, um, we'll, just, we'll, we'll make it work. Other colleagues have had kids and remained MPs and they've made it work and we're determined to make it work as well. Um, we've made it work uh, thus far. Uh, her working in Scotland and me being down here three days a week and I'm sure we'll try and, we'll try and make it work. We'll have lots of support from friends and family. Do you so. know what you're going to have? You don't have to tell me. If we it's don't know. Don't. We don't know yet. No. So August, big change coming Huge your way. Huge change. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> we'll talk to you about it afterwards, yeah. no doubt. <laughs> you it might be more bags under the eyes then. <laughs> Andrew Bowie, thank you. Thank you very much.